So um, for those of you who are brand new, welcome. <clears throat> How are you? See you over there, Bruce and Sue. Um, the, the main, and don't worry about all this stuff right now, the, the main goal, the reason why I started this, uh, we have obviously our ongoing deeper approach to Qigong practice and meditation practice. But like many things in life, if we don't have an incentive to continue to do it over and over, uh, we often miss it. So one of the things I decided to do was to create a systematic way for us to be able to get together and try to touch on these topics. I think also many of the students who have come to the Qigong intensive workshops, the 12 week workshops, uh, we're doing great, learning many great things, but we still need to try to go back and continue to polish and understand and ponder to try and get clear on. So um, the, the bulk of what these classes are about is to one, refresh Qigong theory or to introduce it in some respects, uh, specifically as it pertains to meditation. So let me talk about that for a half a second. I think that um, if you ask anyone about Qigong or their exposure to Qigong, most of them will say, uh, I do Qigong now, I already do Qigong, I understand Qigong. Uh, but what that really means is generally they're doing some form of Qigong uh, movement, Qigong exercises, which are attributable to medical Qigong. So medical Qigong was one of the first Qigong to, to be founded, and that, of course, was to try to keep us healthy. There are several different schools that are developed in Qigong science over time, and I think where we get lost in the weeds is trying to understand what Qigong really is and what the implications are on more of a broad scale. Not everybody cares about the broad scale, but I think that's because they don't understand what they're missing. So today, I think we're going to touch on several of those things. My goal for our chat today is to um, try to give you a little bit, a little bit of, a, of a body and wellness, mental, uh, physical, and spiritual wellness perspective from Qigong application, uh, and then talk about how that translates to meditation and why the meditation component is important. And then we'll also try to do some, some seated meditative work as well, which will be a quick review on how do I start a practice? How do I sit? How do I get comfortable? What's most important? Um, of course, along the way, because you're in the class, by all means, feel free to, to unmute and double check, or you could always write some questions down and I'll try to make sure I hold some time for, for Q&A a little bit later as well. So stepping in, <coughs> I want to talk a little bit about Obviously, we're all uh, dealing with a little bit of this pandemic thing that's happening. So what should be on everybody's minds are lung strength, tissue supporting lung strength and the qualities thereof, your immune system, first and foremost, its strength, its ability to resist things that would cause it um, problems or to, to be hampered and its ability to be able to take care of us. And uh, of course, we also have um, relative mental stressors, how the stress of these types of things or concerns or considerations are impacting us. And today we're going to talk a little bit as well about how the mind functions from a, from a Qigong perspective and how we might try to, to step in and interject what the mind is trying to do, which causes the emotions to be um, unregulated far less regulated, and, and how we would approach the process of being able to try to fix that, or at least improve our control of it. So first, uh, talk just a little bit about qi. So um, qi, for those of you who don't know, simply put, is, is bioelectricity. Um, whether you believe in qi or not, it doesn't matter. Qi, it's there. <laughs> so, so that's okay. You could take that or leave it. But what, what is qi really from a scientific perspective? Um, you've heard of the aura, whether you believe in that or not. A really good uh, concept from my master talks about is if you imagine the body being a machine that's built to handle tasks, etc., that qi is the electric current that that machine needs in order to function properly. So if that current isn't flowing properly to the machinery, you can have a problem with the machinery. If the current is too low, I don't have a sufficient amount of that current, that could also impact the machinery. So if I have too much current, if I have far too much or too much current in one area, that could damage the machinery. 
So chi, um, in basic format, follows the blood. Chi and the blood are, are, as they would say, closely related. Those two things cannot be separated. Chi is also directly related to the air that we breathe. Um, Kong Chi or space Chi is the air that we breathe into the body. And from a Qigong perspective, that's combined with food essence that we, that we eat as well. And these two things combine to make what we call post-birth Chi without going too far down the Chi rabbit hole. But why do those things matter? Why would we even be talking about them and how do they apply relative to our approach to meditation? Well, I wanted to, to start our chat today talking about the body because this is really uh, most of our um, introduction to the concept of Qigong. Meditation, however, usually is something that's associated with the mind, um, sometimes with the spirit, of course, but with calming the mind, quieting the mind, relaxing the mind, relaxing the body, which are, in a way, still physical, uh, physical components. So we don't tend to go deeper into spiritual, in most cases, until the conversation gets deeper. Hence why when I mention people talk about Qigong, normally they're applying that to medical Qigong or movement-oriented Qigong practice, not to, to spiritual or scholarly practices. So when we talk about Qi, our considerations really from a Qigong perspective should be, uh, how are we building it? How do we build chi within the body, right? So that we can maintain an abundant supply for the machine, if, if, you, if you like that example. Um, how do I store it once I build it? Where is that chi stored? Uh, can I improve the, the location that it's stored at? Can I increase its storage for, for bad weather days, let's say, when I need that abundance of storage? And then how do I convert the essence or the chi that I have already stored in the body in order to make that more useful for my system. So these are some, some considerations relative to the machine, the body, and what does that really provide us? Well, when we're talking about chi within the body, we're talking about health. Uh, we're certainly talking about our immune system. We're talking about physical strength. Uh, or, or kind of the strength of our immune system or our health and the system thereof, and having an abundance of chi in order to be able to supply the systems of the body to do their job effectively. So, this maintaining concept, one of the most important outcomes of learning to become uh, a successful Qigong practitioner is not only the awareness of your chi, but first order of business is how do I maintain its storage? How do I retain that energy within my body? Because it is always leaving the body and it's being used to make the body function, back to our machine scenario, right? When we get down to the mind, one of the things I'll talk to you about here, which is really important, when the mind thinks, chi is consumed. When the mind thinks, chi is consumed. When the body moves, chi is consumed. When I think, but those thoughts are erratic, emotionally unstable, um, reactive, or my body goes into a, a sympathetic state, a fight or flight state, that energy pours out, rushes out. And until I can reach a time where I'm able to pull, you know, pull back the dam, so to speak, and stop that flow out, we are spending that energy outside of the body. The energy that we're working so hard to maintain and to cultivate and curate in order to enable us um, to, to build a practice to take care of our body and our health. Everybody okay with that? Thumbs up? Yeah, I don't want to drone on and have everybody nodding off over there. That'd be trouble, I'll bang on the screen. <laughs> okay, so maintenance of that chi, building it, establishing it, um, cultivating it, storing it, learning how to feel it, sense it, and lead it successfully, that is one of the fundamental practices associated with Qigong. So for many who don't have any experience with this, 
um, the first physical practices we do give us a, a, an idea of what chi starts to feel like within the body. In order to do that, we're creating relaxed states, changing. So now we're talking a little bit about methods. So what methods do we use to cultivate chi within the body? Um, some of the more common methods for cultivating chi, without a doubt, will be breath. So qigong is very often referred to as, um, as a breathing practice. And fundamentally, it's true. We already talked about kong qi, which is air qi, space qi. Uh, that's certainly, while uh, air is not qi in and of itself, it is a component that combined creates post-birth qi for the body. So breath, how we're able to exchange gases within the body, how much oxygen we take in, how much CO2 we off-gas in an exhalation, um, how relaxed we can be in order to enable those lungs to be able to function more effectively, more efficiently, to draw more air in and more out without expending a lot of chi that we're trying to conserve. These are first order concerns relative to qigong. Um, physical, of course, physical is another component, another way for us to be able to move qi. As I mentioned, qi gets, uh, is fired and led throughout the body when we're moving, which is why, of course, movement historically is a great practice. And then paths I added in here as well, because this also is one of the components that I think is overlooked in qigong practice. People, again, think that if I'm, I'm moving, that I just, all you have to do is just do it. There's some truth to that relative to medical qigong. But, but if your only goal is to maintain a healthy functioning body and to maintain your meridian system, you can go quite far on that practice alone without having to look too much deeper. But if you're interested in building the body beyond that state, in other words, building the body to be able to... Um, to gain control over your own immune system, right? Which, the, the, if you, any of you are familiar with Wim Hof, which, who's a er, very interesting fellow, there's been multiple studies done on him now, that he, as well as people he's been able to teach, can actually control his own autonomic nervous system. And for those of you who know what that is, that's supposed to be impossible. But he's actually proven that scientifically many times, which means he is able to counteract the body's natural inflammatory response to foreign invasion. So what does all of that mean? It means that through use of breath and through usage of building pathways within the body, so we're talking about different meditative approaches, to directing chi, building it, consolidating it, learning to direct it efficiently and effectively, and then using that to open up pathways within the body that, that provide certain outcomes or benefits, both physically and spiritually, and of course, mentally as well. So when we go back to this body, mind, spirit concept, which has become very cliche, uh, Qigong is one of, from my perspective, one of the most unified theories that is able to accomplish all three of those but it's not enough to just do one component of qigong. We have to be able to go deeper. We have to be able to apply other practices, other pathways, um, once we learn to be able to cultivate that qi. Okay, we all right there? Good, super easy. Next, <laughs> um, from those methods, what does this type of breathing do for us? What does the use of these different pathways or of these physical practices do for me? And one of the most valuable outcomes really, both from especially Taoist uh, Qigong practitioners, but also Buddhist practitioners, has been longevity. So from a Taoist perspective, longevity was a, was a core concern. The Buddhists are willing, I hope I don't offend any Buddhists, the Buddhists are, are typically more than happy to come back several lifetimes in order to reach enlightenment or reach Buddhahood. Taoists are a little bit more um, direct, as I've been taught. They are interested in getting it done now. 
So they tend to be, Taoists tend to be more, uh, I don't want to say forceful, but more liberal in their approach to trying techniques and practices. They tend to be, they're interested in getting it done in this lifetime. So if I don't have multiple lifetimes to accomplish this, this spiritual attainment, what do I need? I need more runway. I need more time. So longevity became a, a, a number one focal point for Taoist Qigong masters to be able to increase their lifespan in order to have more time to cultivate these higher levels of attainment rather than coming back Re rebirthing, being re reborn, for example, starting again and, and rebuilding in that way. So how do we increase longevity? Why is it that so many Taoists, and by so many, I mean a lot, a cliche phrase in Taoism was, if you die before 120, you die young. And this is back when the average lifespan was maybe 30 or 40 years old. So how are humans in this group, able to, to triple the lifespan. This is why they were referred to as Taoist immortals. They weren't immortal, of course, but relatively speaking, when you go through two or three generations of people, people start to think of you as immortal without a doubt. So how is that longevity achieved? Well, through these different practices of breathing practices, physical practices, and learning to be able to cultivate qi through these other pathways, you're able to build and boost hormone production throughout the body, the pituitary and the pineal specifically, which enable us to be able to elevate our consciousness um, with using not only uh, massaging the glands within the system, but we're also talking about boosting the cerebral spinal fluid. So actually getting that fluid to circulate more effectively within the body based on how we're breathing and the gates of the body and the pumps that we're using to breathe through. And then, of course, another very big one was um, practices that were used to be able to cleanse bone marrow. Which, of course, again, from the scientific community sounds ludicrous because you can't clean your own bone marrow. But they seem to have found a way. So a lot of these practices that, that have been around for thousands of years have been kept quiet, have been kept secret, of course, in monasteries and were only handed down to a very specific few people. Um, we're just really fortunate that some people, my master included, Dr. Yang Xingming, took the time, a lifetime really, to be able to translate as much as he could and to take his knowledge and experience and start to convert that, that information into something that's palatable for us in this modern time, how we can actually create uh, a directed approach to doing this. So what does all of that have to do with meditation? Well, these terms, feeling, sensing, and directing, require a condition to change from this. I don't know if you can see that. That's the choppy water, right? The ocean chop. To this, which is the lake that has a bunch of abundant ripples across the water, to this which is a calm, clear pool. So, if I can regulate my state, my energetic state between these three, if I can down-regulate or I can provide this calm, clear condition more consistently, if you think about that in terms of water, which I like to do, if you're in a boat in the ocean and you're looking down at the water and you're seeing these massive swells coming and going, um, one, it's easy to get scared, right? If you're on the bow of that boat and you're hitting those nice big 20, 30 foot waves, climbing those walls and dropping, I have to imagine that's uncomfortable. I don't want to be there. But if you're just floating on a nice calm raft and you're looking down into a crystal clear pool of water, that almost seems like hyp hypnotically inviting. Everything is calm, placid, and it almost looks like another dimension that you, you could access just by reaching in. I think these states are also a great example of what meditative practice and approach gives us. So I'm going to step out of the physical component for a second. Qi, of course, is energetic, but talking about the machine and about longevity, etc., and talked very specifically about the mind. 
So my friends across the pond, um, it seems that many people who, who watched the original video that I posted had sent me messages uh, about recognizing this monkey mind concept. So just to review briefly, from a Qigong perspective, Chinese uh, Eastern philosophy perspective, the mind has two components, the Xin and the Yi. And the Xin, of course, is the emotional mind. That's the forward-facing mind and the one that we interact with each other with. The, it's also the one that has been built or has built our persona, regulated our interaction with the world around us since we were very young. So keep in mind, emotionally oriented, what that means is the shin is what's re responsible for keeping us alive, for keeping us safe. So it's a highly tuned and adaptive tool, mechanism for safety. Safety from being killed has adapted into safety from being rejected, safety from um, going outside without my mask and uh, inhaling a particle that's going to kill me within days, safety from all of these things, crossing the street without hitting the button. These are all shin related elements. The yi is the wisdom mind. So the wisdom mind is typically uh, associated with the horse in Chinese culture. Very strong, very proud animal and very capable, but still wild. Right, still wild. We the horse still needs to be trained in order to be to harness its power for 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 our ends. But the yi tends to have more pure or more altruistic thoughts, whereas the shin, the monkey mind, is really concerned with safety, right, keeping us out of harm's way. And what that does is allows any number of different emotional signals or triggers to come in. If you can imagine. I think our Neanderthal uh, counterparts probably weren't too worried uh, about whether she or he liked him or her, but I am willing to bet you they were probably very concerned about whether they could stay in the tribe or whether they were excluded out of the tribe. Because now you're talking about means of survival as to whether or not you are liked or disliked. So it's really, to me, it's easy to look back into our past history and recognize, wow, this is a highly developed tool. The problem, from my perspective, is that tool, I know I put it on here for you, that tool has been allowed to dominate. The conscious mind has been allowed to drive for pretty much our whole lives. Meditation or our uh, effort or attempt to step into meditation for most is the first attempt to recognize the conscious mind for what it is and to try to interrupt its automatic behavior system. Do you think it likes that idea? <laughs> it's been driving your whole life and the older you are, the longer it's been driving. And then you open the door and say, hey, bud, get out, I'm driving. Ooh, this is uh, off-putting for the conscious mind, to, to, to put it lightly. And um, this is, again, back to many of the things that I hear about, and, and we may do another one next week, are about, I can't seem to stick with a practice. I can't seem to make a practice work. I can't get my mind to calm down enough to to do meditation. I try and I try and I try and it won't calm itself down. Well, again, that's like each day me trying to open the door and take over driving for the conscious mind and it's going to argue. It's going to argue until I wear it down and it enables me to begin driving. And then there's a host of things that can come along after that, but that's just to let, let you know as, as well as to say for my own re reminding it requires us to consistently go back and revisit. It's not going to just allow you to step in, drop into a blissful state, the pond becomes clear and you can see the bottom and everything is lovely. It doesn't generally work that way. So let's talk a little bit about why. And one of the things that's been on my mind a lot lately relative to this is what I would call the gravity of change. I think we're all pretty familiar with gravity 
and, and what part it plays in our life to a greater or lesser extent. And I would like to, um, to offer the idea that change, any, any type of change, specifically in this case, changing how I interact with my mind, my thoughts, and my feelings, is going to have a form of resistance. The body, and most certainly the mind, likes stability. It likes regularity. Whether, whether it's right or wrong, it likes to be consistent. It's when we introduce inconsistencies or we try to take, we try to change uh, the approach, the direction, etc., or who's driving in this case, that we're going we're gonna to receive some form of gravity to a greater or lesser extent. So as an example, and I think this is going to be really relevant to what we're experiencing now, um, there are two states referenced in the body typically, which are sympathetic or parasympathetic, or you hear a sympathetic tone or parasympathetic tone within the nervous system. Sympathetic, what you need to know about that, if you think of the term sympathy, I have sympathy for somebody who's really going to a hard time. Um, sympathetic is attributable to fight or flight. So that is the, that is the, you know, what we call tacky psyche. That's the, that's the, that's the reactionary part of the mind, which causes the nervous system to become jacked up and, and to put you into defensive mode again, fight or flight mode. Um, but that does a number of different things to your system. It's a great survival mechanism, but what happens if I'm triggered into that repetitively, constantly, right? If you imagine somebody who's in a, who's in a verbally or physically abusive relationship, somebody who's in a work environment that, that's just hyper demanding or super high stress. So high stress um, puts us into a sympathetic state. Now, parasympathetic, of course, would be the alternative side to that. Parasympathetic means that the nervous system has been able to calm itself down or we have calmed it down and we've moved out of that fight or flight state and the system has been able to calm itself down or we have interrupted that and calmed it down. So seeking a parasympathetic state is a much more harmonious state for the body. Doesn't mean we want to get rid of sympathetic, by the way, because that's what keeps us alive. But in these modern times, we're relatively safe. If you're going to work and your boss is a jerk, are you going to likely die there? No, let's hope not. Certainly not from the boss. Um, if, if, you're worried about going outside without a face mask because you're going to end up dead within days if you, if you don't do that and you have to wear your face mask in your car and you, you know, all of these, to me, crazy things. What state is that putting you in? Is that making you nice and calm and relaxed? No, it's triggering a sympathetic response. Here's the tricky part. Stressors which cause us to go into a sympathetic state, can become chronic. And remember, it's not like you have a thousand different sympathetic responses. Tiger, sympathetic response. Boss is a jerk, sympathetic response. Somebody barks at you in the donut line, sympathetic response. You see... The, the system doesn't say, oh, it's just, this is, a, this is no problem. The, the volume of that sympathetic response may get jacked up higher, depending upon the perceived threat. But the response is, to the nervous system is going to be similar, if not same, in most instances. So what does that do? That potentially puts us in a state of chronic stress or chronic sympathetic response. So here's why that matters. I, I want to kind of connect the dots here. If I'm chronically in a state of stress or sympathetic response because of my mind, by the way, right? In fairness, who's giving us the signaling about the tiger and the donut and the, and the boss? Is it the world out there that's triggering what's going on inside? Yes or no? No. It's the filter that's interpreting the signal. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. 
Is the filter that's interpreting the system the horse or the monkey? <laughs> the monkey. The vast majority of the time. So if the monkey is constantly being hit on the head with a mallet, right? And then I raise my hand, what does the monkey do? Yeah, is just going to fire, constantly fire. This is the problem with chronic sympathetic engagement or chronic stressors in our system. So when you get online to go read the news about what's happened today and which person is blaming who for what and what's missed what and how many, you know, all of this stuff, you're hitting the monkey with a hammer, by the way, just, just as an aside, <laughs> right? I, I know in a way you like to keep up with world events and what's happening, but you're, you're, you're garbage in, garbage out. We're, we're hitting the monkey in the head. So we are creating an environment of chronic stress. Phones, all of these triggers. If I have anything going on in my system that the, that the conscious mind, the monkey mind, perceives as a stressor, like I said, I lift my hand, it immediately is going to go sympathetic. It's going to trigger lightning fast, and now I'm going to be in this elevated position that I need to then either wait to come down on its own, or I need to be able to manually make an adjustment to backtrack out of that system. So, use of breath, use of physical movement, less about the pathways, but understanding how the shin and the yi interact, and that only comes from me observing their behavior, and maybe it's a good junction to talk about in meditation, observance of the behavior of the conscious mind and the unconscious mind can only come from stillness. Right? You can't be driving your car and observing your mind and how it's functioning. You may think you can, but you're, but you're only seeing a surface level part of that. So meditation provides us a space to be able to start to observe how the mind is functioning. And in this environment that we're in right now, understanding which sets of waves my filter, my conscious mind is actually allowing to occur or is the monkey slapping the water and making the waves right go up and down? Um, how often am I triggering a sympathetic state? And if I recognize that happening frequently, how can I downregulate that mind into a parasympathetic state to get myself to, to calm down out of that? And more importantly, to not, if you're in this relaxed phase, clear, smooth water, and someone slaps the water, it's disruptive, right? But how long before the water goes back to calm? Pretty quick. The ripples begin to send, and out they go to the edges of the pond. But if someone stands there and continues to slap the water, how's the visibility in the pond? It's just going to, visibility is gone. Chaos ensues and will remain until I find a way to stop the monkey. Stopping the monkey in this respect means recognizing what the monkey is, how it behaves, and then learning a series of skills through breath, physical movement. So we've been talking lately about the three levers, right? To, to use the body, to, to use the breath, and to use the mind in order to be able to trigger a parasympathetic response, calm the monkey down, give it a banana so it stops slapping the waves, stops slapping the water, and allow the water to go back to a placid state. This is training. This is us training the conscious mind to, to adhere to a new form of... Um, a new form of stability, a new form of normal. So if we have gotten to a state where normal is chaos, like it is right now and everywhere you're around, I would argue one of the first things to do is to step back, to learn to be able to sit in some stillness, and we'll talk about that, we're gonna step in in just a minute, and to be able to learn to calm 
those sympathetic states down. So we've been talking a little bit lately in the last few weeks about um, anxiety or anxiousness, some, some tension or fears or concerns, worries about health, about loved ones, about uh, you know, global security, about your retirement. I mean, there's, there's count them off, there's a, there's a list of a million things long that can be causing disharmony emotionally. Notice I didn't say they're true or they're false, but they are certainly triggers for disharmony. So what we've been talking about trying to do is how can we um, learn to be able to quiet the mind, to quiet this sympathetic trigger, this, this chaotic environment, and when I calm that down, many things occur. Not only can I begin to take control of the mind and its various different aspects, but now I can come back up here and start to feel or sense. I can start to cultivate and become aware of energy's presence in my body and how it's moving within my body. I can start to become aware of when my energetic state becomes frenetic or is very calm and smooth. I can start to build the skill of teaching my body's energetic patterns to be able to stabilize based on my desires, not based on the filter of what's going on in my world. And I have to tell you, I had a conversation about this uh, earlier with a student. You know, some, some people are asking, you know, I don't even know what to do because things are so chaotic. I, I, I don't know how to help anyone. I don't know. I don't even know what to do about this. And one of the things I mentioned is, you know, we can only control ourselves. You can engage in all kinds of different things. But when you become calm, when you become still, when all of this noise ceases and you can quiet that down to stillness, guess what that enables you to do? To see. To really see through all of the smoke and obfuscation and chaos and look over here and watch this and what about this and the sky is falling and this is happening and you're going to, all of this stuff. We can step back. I often remind myself when I go train with Master Young uh, up in the mountains, I maybe make a phone call once a week. I have no internet. I don't watch TV. Uh, and the sky could literally be falling and I would have no idea. And that's okay. I mean, of course I have a wife and kids and so that would be concerning, but I wouldn't even know until it happened. And if I can control or I can create some stability, some, some certainty for the people that are around me, um, and step away from the chaos and have a center of stability, that starts to resonate with others around you, right? You, you take 10 people in a room and eight of them are very relaxed, breathing soft and meditating. Guess what's going to happen to the other two? They're going to be calm. But you flip that over and you take probably six of those people and you make them frenetic and a little crazy that's going to start to escalate and bleed into the rest of those people. So, this was a lot, uh, especially for you, Eric, unless you've done a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of study in there. This could be a lot of material, but what I wanted to be able to do tonight, um, there were several different things that were kind of tugging at me, and I wanted to be able to address more of a, 5,000 foot level about energy and its place within the body and why that's important, how that interacts with our health and our own wellness, and then how the mind um, interacts with these things and enables us to be able to manage these better. So in a way, it's kind of a virtuous cycle. The, the mind is the general, which enables the energetic state of the body to be felt, sensed, regulated, directed, stored, etc. Those things enable the body to be able to be healthy, healthful, strong, uh, to build the immune system, to increase longevity for the body, 
to provide higher states of sensitivity, etc. And that then also allows the mind itself to, to remain calm, to remain in control and regulated, and to give us a condition or a sense that we are moving in the right direction. So what I'd like to do for today um, is at least get some, some meditation in to calm the mind, because by the way, by me talking about all this, what's happening to your chi? Probably out, more than likely. So what we want to do is we want to turn that around and draw the chi back into the center. So what we're going to do, and um, Eric, for you, I know I sent you those links, so hopefully you got a chance to take a look at that. But um, there's a couple things about meditation. First and foremost, you should be comfortable in all cases. Whether that means sitting on a couch, sitting on the floor, sitting on a cushion, sitting upright at your dinner table, not, not at dinner, right, but meaning in a chair itself. What I want to be able to do ideally is have 90 degrees on my knees, meaning my, my legs are not knee down or knee up, they're flat. Um, great, thank you, Eric. Very cool, I haven't seen that before. Uh, two is that I have a place for my body to be relaxed. So I have a long torso, I tend to slouch, unfortunately, still. So sometimes when I'm trying to relax deeply, I'll just get a nice big pillow or however many pillows I need, stuff them behind my back to help me be relatively upright. And that's important down the road because identifying the two polarities within our body and our central equilibrium line becomes a really important component of building and storing condensing chi within the body. So if my body is in a strange position or bendy and I'm slouching, my breath mechanics suffer, my energetic center suffers, et cetera. So I wanna to try to be in that vertical neutral position and relaxed as possible. So the hands can be where they'd like. You can set them on your knees if you'd like. You can set them in your lap, which is very common, just one hand in front of the other and dropped in the lap to rest on the legs. You do not need to fold your legs up like a pretzel. Pretz, pretzel, pretzel, you know what I'm talking about. Also, you don't need to wrap them inside themselves like a yogi, don't need to do that either. There are some practices that they want to shut off the energy's flow to the legs. So by folding the legs up, even just sitting Indian style like this, I'm reducing energy's ability to flow into the leg vessels. And the leg vessels are big, right? Legs are big. There's four vessels in each leg. So they take a lot of chi. But if I can fold those legs up, I start to squeeze the pipes that let the chi flow out there. And it allows me to keep a more abundant supply in the rest of the body. That's why we do that. But it's not required. Put your feet flat on the floor, stick your legs flat out in front of you, that's okay as well, as long as you're comfortable and relaxed is the most important thing. Next, tongue on the roof of the palate. So remember when we talk about that, if the teeth are in the front, the apex of the roof, the apex of the palate, which is about an inch and a half back in the top, is where we touch the top of the tongue. So, uh, relaxed body, relaxed position, comfortable pillows, blankets, etc. stuff. Try not to be too hot. Try not to be too cold. Was this, was this uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears? Porridge not too hot. Porridge not too cold. Porridge just right. Something like that. It's been a while. So same thing. I don't want to be overly hot. I don't want to be overly cold. You don't want to be hungry where your stomach is growling and nodding. That's not a good place to, to practice. I also don't want to be full because when my belly's full, my digestive system, it's hard to breathe and relax the abdomen. We're not going to talk about types of breathing tonight because I've already jabber jawed your ears off. Um, but what we're going to try to do is just relax and try to assess. For those of you who are coming back today, what I'm going to have you do is work on the mud pill palace. So you're going to go focus on the center point of the mind. So what I'm asking you to do now is I want to cool down the supercomputer. I want to I want to pull the chi back in towards its center and reconsolidate it. So said differently for everybody, including for my students, something to keep in mind. All right. If this is the center, let's just say this is the physical center of the upper Dantian. So this is the location of what we call the mud pill palace or the very center point of the mind. 
There is another center. I, I, I realize that my guy is a little bit angled here, but you'll get the idea. There's another physical center down below. And of course, these two are connected by the spinal cord. When we're thinking or when we're moving, Chi goes from these areas out. Right? <clears throat> when I'm high visual and I'm extending my vision out to look around, when I'm using my arms or my legs, right? That chi has to, has to move itself up and out the arms and down the legs as I'm moving. I know that probably looks a little funky to you, but I think you get the idea. If these two were the storehouses of that energy, the energy is going to be leaving. So one of the first practices we try to become aware of is how do we bring that, reverse all of that flow and bring it back into the center of the physical body, into this line. So uh, for this group, we're going to focus on the center, bringing the mind into the mud pill palace. And what I want you to try to do is inhale, bring, the, bring your mind to the very physical center. You can imagine condensing into a small ball. And then when I exhale, I'm just going to let any tension on that ball go, but I'm not going to try to expand the ball. So I'm going to inhale into the, to the center of the head. And then when I exhale, I'm just going to let that go. One more trick. When I inhale and I come into the center, I'm going to hold my breath there for just maybe two or three seconds. Two or three seconds, and then I let go. So I inhale, condense, and let go. And then I inhale again and condense, and let go. Don't ask me why. Don't ask how it works. <laughs> we don't have time for that tonight. But what I want you to try to focus on is bring the chi back to the center, back to the central equilibrium. If that is uncomfortable for you, focus on the belly. So the lower part of the navel, bring the chi back to the physical center of the body. So just to the middle above the hip bones and just below the navel a few inches and inside the physical center of the body. Okay? So let's go ahead and give this one a shot. Hands in center. Get yourself a comfortable position. Eyes will be closed. For those of you who are newer to this, you don't need to practice on either one of those. What you can do is just place the tongue on the roof of the palate and just try to assess what condition your body is in. How does my mind feel? How are my thoughts? How relaxed or tense is my body? Where is my breath originating from? And just take an inventory. Don't judge. Just take an inventory.
slowly bring the mind back to the lower Dantian. Back to that physical center in the lower part of the abdomen. Become aware of any sounds around the room or the building. And then slowly allow your eyes to open. Good. A um, couple of quick things, I think, as well for uh, those of you who are newer. Normally, lights would be off, so I don't tend to have lights on. Uh, meditating outside can be very nice, but it can also be really stimulating even when the eyes are closed and you end up picking up uh, sun through the eyes. It can be nice, but it can also be really distracting. Also, the outside environment can have a lot of things flitting about, which can be um, distracting. It can also be good training. It can also be a good challenge for you to try to retain your focus and intention, attention uh, to the center, but can be really challenging outside. So much like sleeping, um, you want to try to be able to create an environment that is really conducive to, to calm, to create that tranquil state so that when I step in, I can sense more of what's happening with my mind and with my body and with my energetic state. Um, so it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, like, like now, we can still do meditation with the lights on. Um, but ideal to be able to set up different conditions for yourself. Okay, So I'm going to unmute you guys if you have any questions. So the last couple seconds, minutes here, rather. Okay. Any questions? Hmm? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Wim is Wim's great. I mean, it's nice because, unfortunately... Uh, modern medicine could care less about anything that's happened for any duration of time unless there's, you know, double backflip, blind, placebo, uh, controlled, replicable, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Well, that's happened now. So, so it's very difficult for them to, I mean, they're literally, as from what I understand, rewriting science books based on the findings from his, from his uh, experiments. So pretty, pretty interesting. Anybody else? Wim Hof. Yeah, Sue, go ahead. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, the immune system thing I, I've been talking about for a while. I mean, I don't feel like an immune system expert, so I've been reticent to step into that. But um, I, I certainly think at least maybe for our group, it's worthwhile. Um, Master Yang just recently uh, printed something as well about how to, you know, how to boost your immune system. Um, let's say this. Most of us are immunocompromised. Our immune system is compromised, and many of us have an immune system that is basically fighting itself. That's because the immune system is not functioning the way it's supposed to. It's already compromised. So it doesn't even have the, the functional capacity to do what it's supposed to do. And in fact, those of you who read Master Young's original piece I sent, I sent the kind of the science of Qigong, um, one of the things that he's talking about in that very first introdu introduction piece is that, you know, we, we are out of harmony with nature, of course. Um, and because of the lives that we live, the body has lost its natural capacity to fight off, to fend off illnesses. You know, we have, as he says, become greenhouse kids. You know, we're, 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 we're greenhouse adults. You know, we're born and raised in the greenhouse and heaven forbid you ever lose that because then you're going to get it. So 
part of his kind of little treatise there was to say, listen, we need to, we need to make a change. We need to try to address this. And one of the most direct ways to address it is in fact boosting the immune system. And that's not a single legged stool. New Qigong, your immune system's great. Nope. Uh, lower your stress, your immune system's great. Nope. There are multiple, multiple balls in the air associated with that. Food, fuel, rest, air, uh, certainly stressors without a doubt, which can come from food, you know, these, these other components. Um, the, we also, by the way, have, have genetic um, genetic components within each of us that are a little bit different. You know, we're all an N of one and how we manage stress and how that relates to the body changes. Without a doubt, doing meditative practice, as you all know, can have an immediate and profound impact on stress levels or perceived stress levels within the body without a, without a doubt. Deeper breathing, um, you're activating hormones that are being released by massaging the glands within the body. That's the way the body is meant to actually function. So we're returning hormone or hormonal balance to the system. Um, you and I have talked about before. I'm really fascinated to see. I mean, I just the time. I haven't really had the time to step into like uh, pre post menopausal. I think that there's some very fascinating stuff that that can be can be learned and determined based on qigong science associated with mitigation or maybe even elimination of some of those things which of course are are hormonal in nature so not to drone on about that but there are, immune immunity is complex and it's it i i don't want to oversimplify it but um we can start by doing certain practices that will put our mind in a good good balanced state that can put our physical energetic body in a good balanced state, meaning proper energetic flow to the machine. Um, we can learn ways to be able to boost our Wei Qi, our guardian Qi, which enables our immune system to, to um, let's say, charge to a higher level, to be able to, to sustain its defense. Um, so many of those things we can actually do in physical practice. What does that equate to? I think that depends on each individual person. What's your diet? How much sugar? How is your sleep? How's your hydration? What's your family genetic history? I think there's a lot of different components. But in the simplest terms, let's do the things that we can do, the things that we can affect and impact directly, and then let's try to make the best cake we can with what we have. That's my perspective. And then go see a scientist if you want to go deeper. Have your have your own stuff mapped out and find out. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, you can do genetic mapping. Mapping. They can do, you know, all, all kinds of interesting stuff now. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, Wednesday, we'll probably talk about some of the, maybe some similar material depends on who comes Wednesday. As you know, if, um, if many of the similar cast is here, um, what I would probably ask of you is to think about the components that we discussed and to bring some questions to the table for that. Uh, Eric, for you, just so you know, normally, um, this class isn't just me throwing up on you guys for, for 40 minutes and then breathing for five. I like it to be kind of iterative back and forth a little bit and to give some feedback and guidance. The goal is for everybody to build a meditative practice over time, uh, try to talk about or express challenges or successes that you're having with the practice, and then be able to talk about different ways for us to be able to add layers of skill to the practice so that we can get deeper and become better at applying those. To your question, instructor, I think next week what we'll do is we're definitely going to do more breathing, I think. I'm sorry, Wednesday. Um, I'm probably going to review girdle vessel breathing because that's a really, I mean, that's that's probably the most prominent breath-related practice for boosting the immune system. Um, and we'll probably do a little bit of review for assessment, building on the last couple of classes, building on assessment. And then using breath to downregulate, so so triggering that parasympathetic response. So it'll be a little different. This probably will not still be on the board. Uh, 
Um, well, yeah, go ahead and email them to me if you don't mind, and I'll bring them Wednesday if I think they'll be helpful for the group, okay? Great. Anyone else? We're, we're six minutes over, so I don't want, I don't want anybody missing dinner. <laughs> yeah, I don't want you going into a sympathetic state because we exceeded the, uh, the allotted time frame. <laughs> all right, well, listen, great to, great to see you all. What's that? Are you, who's, you're on the East Coast, Eric? Oh, man. Okay. Well, listen, I'm glad you, I'm glad you stepped in with us. I'm glad it's not too late. Yeah, I, I hope, I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, very good. Well, uh, listen, you all t stay healthy. Uh, try to continue the breath work like we talked about. Make sure that you, you know, look after your mental well-being in addition to your physical well-being. Try to mitigate those Pay attention to the waves. Pay attention to the ripples that are going on for you over the next week, if you would, and just see where your general state of day-to-day -day is at. And then maybe work a little bit on how do I mitigate that and can I downregulate that and, and change to a new normal that's a little less chaotic and find moments where I can make that chaos actually disappear altogether. That would be a great direction of trend. Okie doke.